everyone, please join me in welcoming on stage Sanjeev Rampal with the panel discussion about the current and future state of multi-tenants in Kubernetes. Woo! Uh, good afternoon, welcome everyone. So we are uh, gonna have a panel discussion and we hope to have a lot of audience involvement as well because this is a new topic or a new and old topic because a lot of people feel like Kubernetes already has some level of multi-tenancy, but there's a lot of different opinions on what multi-tenancy actually means in the context of Kubernetes. So hopefully our panel will help us uh, get a little bit more insight into that. A lot of the panelists are also working in the upstream Kubernetes multi-tenancy working group, and a lot of the work reflects what's happening in that group. But really, this, uh, we would really welcome a lot of interaction. Um, give us your feedback, your thoughts, your requirements. How can this work best help the community? Uh, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. Go ahead, Tasha. Cool, hi, I'm Tasha Drew, and I'm a product line manager at VMware. I'm also the co-chair of the multi-tenancy working group uh, for Kubernetes, which is under SIGAuth. I'm Ryan Bezdechek, I'm a software engineer at Cray, the supercomputer company, uh, and I'm a member of the multi-tenancy working group. Hi, I'm Erica. I work at Red Hat, uh, leading the authentication and authorization team for OpenShift. I joined from the CoreOS acquisition. Hi, my name is Paul. I'm a cloud engineer at Singular, and I've been working on doing a multi-tenant implementation for five months, more or less. And I'm Sanjeev. I work at Cisco, and we, uh, my team is working on an enterprise Kubernetes platform. I'm also involved in the multi-tenancy working group upstream. So um, we'll, uh, we'll start with a few common questions. Uh, firstly, maybe just as a show of hands for all of us to get familiar, um, how many of you would say, you would say that um, you have a good feel for current multi-tenancy capabilities in Kubernetes? Would you say you, you understand it pretty well? Okay, so maybe about half. How many of you feel like the current functionality in Kubernetes is adequate to build a multi-tenant solution? Um, and the other alternative being, no, we need to have more work in Kubernetes to additionally support multi-tenancy. So how many feel that current Kubernetes is adequate? Okay, not too many. Um, and just to confirm, do the rest of you feel like more work is needed or? Okay, so there's a strong um, audience uh, pr uh, preference for that. That's great. So what we felt in the community is that there's a lot of um, custom solutions that combine namespaces, RBAC, network policy, but everyone's solution seems to be different, and officially, CNCF doesn't really have a position on whether Kubernetes does actually support multi-tenancy or not, and whether I can take my application from one Kubernetes cluster from vendor X and run it on vendor Y's Kubernetes cluster, and I'll still get the same multi-tenant behavior? Probably not. So uh, maybe our panel, we can start with um, what you feel like uh, the community needs to do through the working group as well as through um, other uh, community events to f further the state of multi-tenancy. So Tasha, maybe we can start with you and go around. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the best thing that everyone can do if you see a need for additional multi-tenant solutions within uh, upstream Kubernetes is participate in the working group. We have a bunch of documents, um, all of which you can check out on our uh, repo, which is in the uh, Kubernetes-sig slash multi-tenancy uh, repo. Um, basically, if you go to docs, we just have a links page that has all of our uh, docs and um, what we've been doing is uh, collecting user stories and use cases from the community to understand how people want to use multi-tenancy and what their use cases are. And so that is super open. Um, we also have some pr proof of concept work that we're working on that we'll probably talk about more. Um, but just at, at the like the easiest way to get this moving is to really show the demand for it and to help us really um, narrow in on the exact use case that the community is looking for. Right. The question is what they can do or what we What can the uh, working group do and what can we do together with the community? 
Well, I mean, Tasha kind of took all the thunder, but yeah, I mean, show up to our meetings, right? And uh, we need help. And the other thing is be vocal. Um, so clearly a lot of people want more with multi-tenancy, um, but uh, there's a lot of people that aren't convinced that any more work is needed. Um, so I guess vocalize your guys' desires um, for multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Erica. To reiterate, definitely please show up and speak up. There within the working group and across Kubernetes, I think one thing what really we are all very hungry for is real use cases and users and what the real trade-offs that you have to make are. It's hard to make the decisions technically of what is worth the effort not without getting a better sense of what that will actually mean to real users. Yeah, so I think coming up everyone um, and speak about it, we'll be able for, to make a decision on what's the best option. There's many options to make multi-tenancy. There's also still maybe not everyone speaks the same when they say hard multi-tenancy and soft multi-tenancy. So I think this is really important to, for everyone to speak the same language. Okay, thank you. So essentially the takeaway is that a lot of people have semi-similar ideas, but there hasn't been a standardization effort yet. Maybe the working group can be a common forum for all of us, all of you, to bring your thoughts so that we can consolidate that into a, a commonly accepted multi-tenancy architecture. Um, well, maybe the next point that maybe we can uh, go over is, uh, so there's this, perception that there's soft multi-tenancy requirements for enterprises and hard multi-tenancy for hosting. Your thoughts on um, whether that's a, that's a genuine demarcation and, and do we want to proceed on both directions in parallel and so on? Sure. Um, so, uh, for people who haven't been super involved in the working group, we have uh, things that we, t these terms we toss around, and one is soft multi-tenancy and one is hard multi-tenancy. And basically the difference between the two is uh, the degree of trust you can have for users who have access to the Kubernetes API. So if you have a reason to believe that the users of your system can be somewhat trusted, like they have a motivation to not aggressively hack or DDoS um, other users, then you can potentially potentially be satisfied with a soft multi-tenancy solution and allow access to the API server from these tenants um, without being deeply concerned about security. If you don't have the ability to trust users and you want to give them access to the API server, then you're going to need a solution called hard multi-tenancy. Um, and that, the implementation to that is going to require a lot of work. Um, for example, uh, pulling in uh, API, uh, SIG API machinery and so on. Uh, one thing I will add is that if you go to the working group GitHub page, um, there's, there's a bunch of documentation. There's also some prototypes that the group has started putting together. So please visit that and see whether that works for you. Uh, please feel free to join the meetings and provide your requirements, input, comments, criticism, uh, so that we can collectively work on moving this forward. Yeah, and we have some really cool um, potential implementations of how we might achieve both soft and hard multi-tenancy. Uh, all of our videos from our regular meetings are online on a YouTube channel, uh, which you can check out. But just at our last meeting, uh, we had a team from Alibaba demonstrating um, basically a nested API server implementation uh, to allow them to have a greater degree of control to their users. And they're really looking for feedback on that to see if that would solve a lot of people's multi-tenancy use cases. So almost every meeting, we have people coming and showing what they've done um, and doing suggested reference architectures uh, and getting feedback on all of those and kind of sharing them to see what mind share grows around them is really important. So let's talk about what you all have seen in the real world in terms of current attempts at uh, having a custom multi-tenancy solution. Pao, you're, uh, you work for a company where you already have built a multi-tenant hosting Kubernetes. Anything you can share with the audience? Yeah, so in our case, uh, we decided against putting like hard multi-tenancy or having a cluster for each one. And the decision is made in order to be able to have a single control plane and not having multiple control planes allows better resource usage. So for example, we can share the same ingress, but later we can discuss if this is good or bad. 
Okay? But in, in our case, we, we decided that the best option was to have a single namespace uh, for each tenant, and then trying, allow, uh, trying to do it the best way possible in order for them not to be able to know that there are other people in the same cluster. And, and you're running uh, katespin.cloud, so that's an interesting initiative for anybody that wants to try it out. Thanks. Uh, Erica, um, so you work with Red Hat. The, you've had a lot of deployments already with some level of OpenShift multi-tenancy. Can you comment what you're seeing in the field and what Red Hat is seeing? Sure. Red Hat with OpenShift has a wide range of support for multi-tenant um, isolation concepts. For one is just this kind of security and controls needed for the enterprise users available in the uh, OpenShift container platform that our customers run on cl various clouds and bare metal situations. Then we all, the OpenShift also has OpenShift dedicated where they we manage and run the clusters for you, so that's more of a multi-cluster solution. On top of that, there's OpenShift Online, which is a multi-tenant uh, platform that we offer where it's kind of, you know, you get a limited number of namespaces that you can play around with. So in that sense, OpenShift Online is really our place where we explore and try to harden as much as possible what we can do as a multi-tenant platform in Kubernetes, with Kubernetes. Any thoughts on customers using Kubernetes on bare metal and using tenancy to carve up bare metal clusters? I was talking with a lot, some of the customers and such. The, I think when they get there, they'll be excited to have those problems, but so many other technical issues are the biggest concerns. So I'm, IPv6 is the first one that most people uh, bring up. I'll give them a little bit of time to work that out, and then I'm sure they'll have a lot more to say about it. So the, uh, is it fair to say that the takeaway is that what you're seeing so far is uh, OpenShift Online is your primary multi-tenant vehicle at the point, at the moment, although you support it in multiple offerings, uh, but people still tend to use a virtualization platform under OpenShift to provide the tenancy, sort of multiple clusters built on OpenStack tenants, for example. Is that uh, fair? Statement? Uh, often, yes. Uh, the support, there's a, I know a lot going on within both OpenStack and Ironic and its integration right. with running OpenShift on OpenStack. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Ryan, you are at Cray, and everybody's familiar with uh, the uh, very classical company here, Cray, moving into uh, Kubernetes and Cloud. So tell us what Cray is doing and how uh, multi-tenancy would help what you're doing at Cray. Sure. So, so right. So we have supercomputers. Um, so you know, a supercomputer is generally like an entire data center that's kind of seen as one object. Um, and so, uh, in order to kind of manage the entire supercomputer, we have a Kubernetes cluster running in front of it on you know commodity hardware um, that is handling all of the microservices to um, do boot up in OSs and firmware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, with that, we also need to provide access to the supercomputer with it and. Part, partition or tenant um, the, the supercomputer. So multiple universities want to allow students and professors to do research, um, or you know, supercomputers aren't cheap, so uh, more and more universities want to share a single supercomputer so that they can split the resource. So we have kind of a concept of a tenant is, um, is both allowing the, the users, the end users to deploy their own um, workloads and services within our Kubernetes cluster to, to interact with the, the supercomputer, but as well as tenant in partitioning the actual underlying hardware to, to make that happen so that to the, the single tenant, it looks like they have their own supercomputer, um, but it's really you know one giant one that's shared. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of folks would be really curious, both from an intellectual perspective as well as from uh, many other aspects, as how supercomputing, uh, Kubernetes, and multi-tenancy come together. Right. And I'm sure we would love to hear more from you uh, over the coming months. Uh, Tasha, from a VMware's perspective, do you have any, uh, uh, any uh, color you can provide to the audience on what you're seeing uh, with VMware customers? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, VMware customers are obviously uh, tend to be large enterprises, and the way that they interact with Kubernetes clusters and multi-tenancy is they want to share, and this is a really common use case across many companies, uh, they want to share Kubernetes clusters between departments or between teams, and so they're just trying to figure out, like, how can I restrict access to this, but uh, have similar tool sets and not have to have uh, hundreds of Kubernetes clusters running around. Okay, so I'll take a pause from the panel and maybe open up so that we'll have some um, audience interaction uh, throughout the discussion. Um, would anybody have a question that you think is a burning question you would like to pose to the panel that you want uh, to raise? Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we were going to ask people to come to, uh, come to, yeah. So we'll go back and forth between the audience and the panel. Please think of some questions you may have. Yeah, go ahead. OK, it's a, it's a practical one. So you mentioned that you have some use cases collected in the, in the repo. So there I found only one profile and uh, like a links document right. to link it to a, like, I know, a bunch of Google Docs and yeah. whatnot. So can you just explain how this is working? Yeah. How so can we contribute to this? And yeah so, um, yeah, so the project is still early. Uh, we have some initial information on profiles. We have some initial POC of um, a controller that enforces tenancy. So uh, let me kind of take a step back here. And one of the things we've um, found is that there are basically four architectural approaches to doing multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Approach number one, is multiple clusters running on an IaaS, okay? So you could be running OpenStack and just giving multiple clusters to folks. That's one form of multi-tenancy that people are using. Let's call that solution option A or model A. Um, model B is a single Kubernetes cluster, but with uh, new CRDs for tenants, tenants templates, uh, namespace templates, and um, that is what we are prototyping. Uh, so that's what you've seen in the repo as sort of the early uh, prototype. But we want feedback from the community to see whether we should push forward further. So far, the feedback we've got is that, yes, we would like to see that model developed further. A third model that we uh, have received from the community is Kubernetes on Kubernetes with multiple clusters running on top of a single master Kubernetes cluster, and each tenant getting their own Kubernetes cluster, but not running on top of an IaaS, rather running on top of another Kubernetes cluster. So more cloud-native solution rather than combining with IaaS. That is a proposal from Alibaba that uh, we only have an initial proposal in the repo, so we expect to see more um, over the coming months. And finally, we have an option four, option D we call it, where we would require a change to core Kubernetes to add the concept of a tenant into each API call, make tenancy a first-class citizen. That requires a lot more work in the core Kubernetes, and that will happen only if the community expresses strong interest that that's what we want. So we are bringing this early so that we want you all to work together, all of us, to pick one or more of these options to develop further. So yes, the repo still has very early, very early information. Please contact the team on Slack, and we can uh, work with you further. So my question regarding the OpenShift online, um, the way you're currently building there, um, is, it, is it taking a soft or a hard multi-tenancy approach within the lab? Uh, the, as hard as we can make it. <laughs> If that makes sense. Uh, the distinction between hard and soft, the online is our best attempt to do a hardened free, anyone can use it untrusted, but with limits since it's new technology. The, yeah, I think the line between hard and soft is very fuzzy, yeah. very fuzzy these days. Uh, where even VMs have some level of leakage that we worry about. But uh, I think uh, one of the main things is the OpenShift Online is, is um, 
There is a common API server, right? So yeah, so then there's this centralized kind of versus decentralized or delegated API models. So OpenShift Online is very centralized and very tightly controlled, and you have a limited number of things and you know, unprivileged pods that you're allowed to run versus OpenShift Dedicated, where components that run on an OpenShift cluster you know, can provide and provision a full cluster for each tenant. And that way, you could you know, configure more of your own policies and decide what you want to run and have your own control plane. And again, this, all this, um, this fuzzy boundary between soft and hard is partly because Kubernetes never really standardized what is multi-tenancy. And so every distribution or platform has their own version of it. And part of the mission of this working group is try to bring some level of consensus. So we have a multi-master, uh, multi-workers deployment. Basically, we have a different business units, different teams, right? Now they have to publish their own API and their own uh, document, you know, containers, and they should be able to run it only by themselves. And they, I mean, others should not see others and should not delete. Or, I mean, that is the requirement what we have. So instead of running multi multiple clusters for a different team, we want to run one cluster for everybody. So basically, we want to know what is, uh, what is the easy way of doing currently with the soft multi-tenancy. Maybe a hard and multi-tenancy is not there. Is there any other way to that we can deploy, deploy it? Right. Yeah, so something that uh, we're working on right now is defining uh, a standard multi-tenancy profile, um, which I think kind of gets back to an earlier question. So uh, if you look at Istio docs, for example, you can click on a link in Istio docs that will tell you how to configure Istio for a multi-tenant uh, multi configuration. And Kubernetes doesn't have that in upstream. So everybody is configuring their own cluster um, with how they think uh, a good multi-tenant solution would be. So what we're looking to do is take all of those examples from the community, make a standard profile, um, and then share that uh, not only in Kubernetes docs, but also with um, the bug bounty program, and so then get feedback from the bug bounty program from the security researchers so that they would tell us, you know, these were the problems we found with that soft multi-tenancy solution, and then we can iterate on it from there. Um, but that is something that's like uh, we have defined as our next thing to tackle, um, and so it's an active like thinking, basically. Um, and so we need to kind of start writing that all down and then taking it through the process. Um, we also had a working group deep dive session, and we've had some YouTube videos. Uh, well, not, they're not on YouTube yet, but uh, you can go through the main project webpage, and you'll have pointers. So please go through that and, and send us your feedback. Um, one more question before we come back to the panel. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, Wes, I wanted to come back on the plan B that you mentioned. Yeah. It's basically uh, relying on existing Kubernetes resources. Uh, for the most part, but with a few more custom resources? Yeah. Yes. OK. Um, I just wanted to know if you, have, if you think about any limitation in terms of uh, 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 contenancy, actually, uh, whether uh, the network, uh, how, how can you limit the network access to other namespaces or other resources? Uh, how can you limit leakage, uh, memory leakage, or whatever? Uh, what are the limitations that you see using existing Kubernetes resources to make multi-tenancy work? So the question is that um, taking the option B as an example, what are the limitations in current Kubernetes, whether it is in the area of network isolation or other uh, features like port security policy that you all see today that need to be addressed? So. Yeah. So also but the biggest one, right, is cluster-wide resources. You know, there's it's kind of hard to prevent that. So especially like uh, storage and CNIs and a lot of the the the, the cluster-wide resources that are deployed. And you know, if a tenant wants to deploy an operator and they have their own CRDs, it gets difficult when you have multiple namespaces and cluster-wide. So that's really the big one I, that I can think of. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think some of the things are delegated, like authentication and authorization schemes that can guarantee that it's kind of scoping down as the delegation goes. Uh, resource controls and quotas are a 
big concern. Uh, I think almost everyone struggles with that right now, of how to properly cap and keep things from overrunning. And as well as kind of securing and making sure that you keep, the control plane needs to be available. You can't, and if you're trying to give access to it in some kind of parceled fashion, making sure that no one's overusing it or it's getting controlled. Those are just a few of the things. Wow, you're running um, a multi-tenant hosted service. Uh, what are the challenges you're seeing in yeah. Kubernetes today? So, so one of the first uh, things we found is that the API was not designed in a multi-tenant in mind. So uh, we've been working really hard in order to extend it in some ways, especially using, for example, Open Policy Agent, where we are using uh, validators and mutators in order to uh, give it some capabilities uh, that are needed for enclosing some of the APIs. And then you're also losing some of the endpoints. For example, you cannot list namespaces. Either you see them all or you cannot see anyone. So there are some limitations in the API that need to be addressed. But I think this is something that will have to go to the other. I think the point you're things. making is that RBAC today in Kubernetes is coarse-grained, exactly. and you need a fine-grained RBAC. One way to do that might be through OPA, uh, Open Policy Agent, for folks that um, may be familiar or not so much. But that's, again, part of the collaboration that we hope to do with the community to prepare some profiles and uh, recommended reference architectures. Um, OK, uh, let's go on to uh, what new technology are you all uh, most looking forward to in terms of enhancing current um, Kubernetes multi-tenancy capabilities? It could be something like Open Policy Agent, or it could be some of the newer container runtimes like Cryo and Kata containers for isolation. Which do you feel is the most important um, new technology that needs to fill the gap of the current Kubernetes multi-tenancy solution? So maybe we can start with Pao again. Yeah, so, so when we were thinking about uh, this multi-tenant solution, we, one of the options that we were thinking about was assigning a node to a user, trying to make uh, nodes assign. But then this is something that you start losing res some resources. And then uh, some boxing came up with some things like Gvisor where you are spinning like a small, a new, a new layer on top of the node. So now we are happy with this solution in order to know that if somebody can escape the pod, they still have another layer to go until they reach the host. So I think this is something really important. So you'd like to see, uh, uh, well, you can do uh, tenant uh, tying to nodes through taints and so on, but, but you'd like to see more in that area. Uh, do you think uh, OPA and other such uh, products are appropriate for that? Well, yeah. I mean, for now, uh, if we have Gvisor, we have completely discarded the, the option or, for example, of giving a node to a user because we think that is enough. But absolutely more tools are needed in order to complement other sites of the Kubernetes ecosystem, like OPA, for example. Erika, what do you and our uh, other folks at Red Hat believe is, are the emerging technologies which are most relevant to enhancing multi-tenancy? Oh, there's so many to pick from. <laughs> um, I think. Uh, hmm, so, uh, to, just to give a, uh, either it could be in the runtime category with things like cryo and so, so on. So, OpenShift 4, or in the all cryo. We're 100% in on that one, um, which is fun. I don't have to worry about it as much. Uh, I think I am most, the thing that I'm kind of excited about is adding some formalization in to the types that we're talking about so that we can unify and sort of program on top of all of these solutions if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In terms of cool factor, though, eBPF wins and Celia. <laughs> Ryan, what are you uh, looking forward to most in terms of um, enhancement? She, she told my, stole mine at the last mm -hmm. minute. So yeah, BPF uh, is pretty awesome, and I'm really excited about it. And so you know, that, uh, as, long as, as well as you know, Open Policy Agent, I think between those two, I mean, that solves a lot of needs. Um, not, not all of everything, but. 
So BPF, let's dig into that further. BPF as a part of the network plugin or other uses, uh, other security use cases of BPF? Uh, yeah, so yeah, um, so yeah. Yeah, so BPF, Berkeley Packet Filters, uh, uh, Linux kernel capability allows uh, more flexible ability to set up filters and policies <laughs> without actually having to modify uh, the kernel, eBPF actually, extended BPFs. And so there's new network plugins that are leveraging that Plus, uh, the question was, is that where you're looking forward to, the use of eBPF in network plugins or in other aspects of Kubernetes as well? I think the network is the first place, as in the name Berkeley Packet, or packet Filters, the packets. It was meant to be at the more of the networking layer, so that makes sense as the first place to do this. Some of the pe uh, people at Red Hat working on the kernel kind of cringe a little bit when I say BPF because it's a bit of a hack. But really what it is is that we have containers as this isolation, but then managing a lot of what goes on in the life cycle of those containers is not as easy to manage and deal with. And so here's kind of a, a way to deal with that and put something, that layer between the outside world and your, the containers. And that's, I think, why it's so, it has a lot of potential for whether it's just monitoring or dealing with the network layer and dynamic kind of routing. Uh, let's talk about existing Kubernetes features that people may typically want to use. So part security policies is one. Uh, it's a little bit, different people have different opinions about part security policies. Let's by a show of hands, how many people are actually using pod security policies today? That's a, um, a, that's a good number. So, I mean, there is right now active discussions on how to take pod security policies forward um, and how much of that sort of may overlap with more dynamic uh, admission controllers. So, uh, any thoughts from anybody on the, on the panel on pod security policies and uh, how yeah. they... I have a lot of thoughts on this because yeah. uh, OpenShift had, before pod security policies, had a concept called security context constraints, which are slightly more featured than pod security policies. That makes it means as much as we would like to be full upstream, we would need to work with the community to move pod security policies along. Just like a small example is having some priorities so that it's not such a random ordering of what gets applied to the, how the policies are applied. On the other hand, the question is, do we want the pod security policy kind of concept at all, what, as opposed to use, utilizing OPA and, for instance, the kind of framework that the pro, their sub-project gatekeeper is looking at right now? I don't actually know. <laughs> is the po uh, you're involved in the policy working group as well? Yes, the Kubernetes policy working group. We have an intro or deep dive, I forget which, tomorrow. Is, is the policy working group have a direction in terms of PSPs versus OPA versus XYZ? Uh, never a versus, I think. We're in discussion. Uh, we could use my input. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have a thought on... Uh, either part security policies or equivalent uh, admission control capabilities? Well, I think resource quotas, as they said before, is something really important because once you divide the cluster, you want to have resources for all of them. But it's actually something very limited right now because, for example, you, if you have one pod in a namespace, you can have resource allocation and then resource limits, but it's actually managed at pod level, because at the resource quota is just a limit, it's just a number that doesn't make anything. Actually, what it's making it work is at the pod level, so it would be nice to make it work at the namespace level, for example, and this is something that needs to be addressed, maybe. Any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, maybe we'll uh, come back to the audience. Um, any more you know, thoughts at the top of your mind? what would you like to see the community do better in terms of helping um, Kubernetes get a more proper multi-tenancy solution? Uh, just, uh, just a thought. I'd really like to see the a, a straightforward way to isolate namespaces from each other in terms of network traffic. And there, you know, I understand you can do it, kind of, with certain uh, uh, network plugins, but it doesn't seem like straightforward or easy. Okay, 
So that is definitely part of the reference security profiles that the working group is working towards. Any other thoughts on what you would like to see more? You have time only for one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one question. Where do you see the difference between port security policies and uh, over hardening you can have by uh, have, uh, like using different CR CRIO, like uh, Kata containers or uh, or even uh, via virtual kubernetes or v1 uh, gvisor i think pod security policies what they're really doing is allow you to kind of classify pods by the level of privileges that they can have you would like to on certain nodes and with certain users you know, and in certain namespaces where you have very controlled network or whatever else that they can not run as root, for instance, that they have utilized all of the best of the security isolation that Linux provides, whether it's App Armor or SE Linux, as opposed to when you do want, now that we're running more Kubernetes on Kubernetes and the, you know, including even like OS configuration, you need more privilege. And then, so you would need to separate out. So if, once you can classify your pods by these privilege levels, you can more easily and dynamically define and how those work together, whether it's, you know, privilege, no unprivileged, a privileged pod can only run on the master and only in these namespaces, things like that. Yeah, I also think that the, for example, the sandboxes might help you reducing the security of the pod security policies a little bit, but that is all, that is scary, so <laughs> nobody does that, and it's still something that is coming out, the sandboxes, so have to wait. Um, one other point is that uh, there is a certain point of view that multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters should only support non-privileged containers, non-root containers, but there's a feeling that that may be too restrictive to application teams. The, by show of hands, how many feel it's okay to have multi-tenant clusters which require all containers to run as non-root, non-privileged containers? So you don't feel like that's a, an inconvenient restriction on the application teams. That's a fair restriction. I think that's good because we, even in the enterprises that I have talked to, they are conservative at this point in saying, if I'm going to create a shared cluster, the only applications that run on the shared cluster will be completely non-privileged, no privileged containers, um, no access to host uh, resources like uh, host network and so on. Even though some vendors, uh, including uh, some of the folks uh, on the stage, do have multi-tenant support, but they allow uh, tenants to you know, open host network ports and so on. And I feel like that's a gray area. So it sounds like most people are saying it's okay to have strictly non-privileged users in a multi-tenant cluster. If you want any privileges, okay, here's your dedicated cluster. You can use that, right? Okay, sounds so, good. Thanks uh, for the good talks, we ran out of time. How much time do we have? Oh, it's, it's gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so clearly we could be uh, talking about a lot more. Um, any, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just open it up to maybe one closing thought from each of our panelists. Um, you know, anything that you would like to kind of take away for yeah. the audience? Uh, please check out what the working group's doing. Uh, share your user stories, share your use cases, uh, and let's solve this uh, together. Right. Yeah, please come to our meetings. <laughs> Definitely bring your, you, your real use cases for one. That's always so important. Uh, I'm always here to geek out about policy or anything else if anyone wants to. Uh, that would be great. Please do contribute. Uh, yeah, and don't run privileged pods, please. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say, say the same and just come to the working group uh, say what you think and also express what you're trying to do with this and then we can everyone can get to a good solution yep so please uh, let's make this collaborative 
from the initial show of hands, everybody thinks this is an important problem. Everybody thinks that this is not yet fully defined. So please, let's work on it together, and uh, let's hope next year we'll be able to say that we have made a lot of progress. Also, help out in contributing to the core projects that support that we run on, because if those people are exhausted and don't have time, then we're never going to be able to do new features either. So like at CD, could oh, use some love and help. So thank you to our panel for a uh, nice <laughs>